Assalamualaikum dan selamat sejahtera. Terima kasih kepada semua yang menghadiri sesi webinar kita pada pagi ini. InsyaAllah kita akan mulakan sesi webinar kita dalam masa lebih kurang 8 minit sahaja lagi. Mohon untuk semua peserta mutekan mikrofon semasa uh, Prof. Izzah menyampaikan talimat sebentar nanti. Terima kasih.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan selamat sejahtera kepada semua yang menyertai Edu Scholar Webinar series kita pada pagi ini. Terlebih dahulu mewaris, mewakili barisan penganjur Fakulti Pendidikan UITM dan bahagian penyelidikan dan inovasi Yat Tencangan Selangor. Kami ingin merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada semua peserta yang datang dari UITM dan juga dialu-alukan penyertaan daripada IPT dan organisasi yang lain. Untuk maklumat para peserta, pautan untuk pendaftaran pada Google Form akan diberikan di ruangan komen sebelum tamat sesi webinar kita nanti. Staff UITM akan diberikan jam latihan manakala peserta dari organisasi luar akan menerima e-sijil daripada pihak menganjur. Baiklah hadirin sekalian, tanpa membuang lebih masa dipersilakan Prof. Dr. Faiz Abdul Majid untuk menyampaikan perkongsian yang bertajuk Student Empowerment in Pedagogy dipersilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Salam Ramadan ke-20. Alhamdulillah, bersyukur saya kehadrat ilahi kerana dengan limpah kurnianya dapat kita bersama-sama pada hari ini untuk uh, mendengar sedikit apa yang saya ada untuk saya kongsikan dengan rakan-rakan. Um, sesuatu yang saya jangkakan merupakan orang kata apa, uh, satu topik yang mungkin di dinanti-nantikan, walau alam. Tapi kalau saya um, ini adalah satu uh, isu yang pada kala ini yang sangat sangat saya harapkan pencambahan idea bagaimana untuk kita meneruskan kehidupan sebagai seorang pensyarah dalam menang menangani pandemik uh, COVID-19. Namun sebelum saya bermula, saya mohon izin untuk berbicara di dalam bahasa Inggeris untuk memudahkan uh, Uh, slide saya juga dalam bahasa Inggeris jadi mungkin uh, tidak menjadi kesilap, uh, kesalahan ya, ataupun uh, gangguan kepada rakan-rakan yang dengar di luar sana. Uh, tajuk, uh, sorry, I, I'll begin in English, sorry. Um, first and foremost, the title student empowerment is actually not not uh, an alien term to all of us. Um, for those who were in the faculty of education, who were professionally trained as a teacher to do or, uh, you know, or, or even many of us who've, who've attended uh, courses at uh, ILCAM then and now ILD, there are many modules uh, related to student empowerment. So I assume that this may not be something new. So, but the question is, that was then, that was then before what is happening now happened, you know. We were thought about student empowerment, we were given ideas on the teaching strategies, on what to do to encourage students' participation. But that was when we had our students right before our eyes. The, 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 tra the tragic now is the fact that we don't have them right before our eyes. So, hence the term pedagogy. I don't know about you, but I am for one, had that panic attack when, when we had to conduct our classes um, via ODL uh, because I'm so used to having students before me because I'm quite a tactile person. You know, I like to, to see them in their eyes. I like to see their facial expression. I like to see their body language because those are cues to me. When I teach, I look at the facial expression. I look at the body language. And then I look at their interaction amongst their friends, immediate interaction, the immediacy of the context actually were feedback for me to, to, to decide what to do next and what to do next in my class. But the thing is, oh dear, I only have a flat screen before me. And uh, for one, I, I do like dialogic pedagogy. I mean, for those who were once my student, you would understand how I would have my classes. I would never be the only one talking. In fact, I would just be you know, spark, uh, what do you call that, uh, sparkling, uh, sorry, uh, I will just sparkle your interest and then trigger you with questions and then you'll be discussing and then I'll be jotting down what you said on top of whatever I have on the PowerPoint. But basically the PowerPoint is already there, you would have read it before you come to class. But the thing is, the, the, the organic nature of A class depends quite 
heavily on the interaction between teacher and student. Oh, by the way, I hope you don't mind when I use the word teacher to address all of us because teacher is such a generic term to refer to cikgu or lecturer or pensyarah. Yeah? So please uh, do not mind when I say when I use the word teacher because uh, I mean teacher as, as all of us here uh, in the education uh, discipline, in the education line. So when, when as, as a teacher, it is very important for me to 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 make my students engaged with each other, uh, engaged with the activity, to interact with each with, with each other, and also with me. And it is from those interaction that that I know that they are learning, or uh, there are areas where I would need to provide more inter, more feedback, you know, or more input. Uh, but that's the thing. Uh, that's that's why the panic gaji materialize. You know, the panic attack. Uh, I'm sure if I were to see all of you here, if I were to ask a raise of hand, I can imagine the whole uh, audience would raise their hand. You know, it's like, let's right, not deny it. We had our panic, right? And maybe some of us are still feeling that panic. Okay, so just like what we do in our class, um, we would, uh, in a way, um, sort of like, you know, um, inform our students what the lesson is for, what are, we, what are we hoping to achieve at the end of the lesson. So hopefully... Um, friends, my fellow colleagues at, of UITM, and also from other institutions, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, this is what I have in mind. You know, uh, inshallah, by the end of this one hour session, you'll be able to employ the concept of student empowerment in your classes. Not that you haven't done it, but here we're talking about classes at, at, at during this uh, period of time, you know. And, and on top of that, for you to be able to provide meaningful learning experiences despite, I think that the, the final phrase is very important, despite the time of crisis. Now, friends, um, this, these are my, my thoughts on what the training outcomes would be. But I welcome you if you have a paper, if you've got a pencil with you or a pen with you, why don't you jot down on a piece of paper, what are your goals? What do you, what do you expect you would get at the end of this webinar? And let's see, later, uh, hopefully I'll remember this later at the end of the webinar, I'll be asking you to look again at your listed uh, goals and see whether you've achieved, whether you've, you've obtained what you wanted to obtain from this uh, one hour talk from me, inshallah. Okay, moving onwards. To guide us through, this is what I have outlined for the next one hour. Uh, allow me to share with you the, the bit that I know about pedagogy. Um, and at this point of time, I'm sure at the back of your mind, you are thinking about pedagogy, you're thinking about andragogy. And if you remember the, the previous uh, two uh, minister of higher education, that was Regis Druso, mentioned about cybergogy and hutagogy and paragogy. You know, those are the terms which are already documented quite well in the literature. If you were to to Google literature or any empirical research on pedagogy, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't find because the term pedagogy is actually a buzzword. It just appeared um, easily, nothing more than eight weeks ago. Uh, I will tell you more about, about the, the uh, who coined this term pedagogy. It, wa it wasn't me. I wish it was me, but it wasn't me. But but I suppose in Malaysia, I've yet to see people talking about pedagogy. Uh, we started talking about pedagogy when a group of us, yeah, Tassel alumni, uh, for information, I graduated uh, at Tassel uh, in 1993 from UKM, and we were the pioneering group. So there were a whole bunch of us who were still close with, with each other, the Tassel one uh, girls and uh, uh, boys, yeah, brothers and sisters. About a month, a month or so ago, we held our own uh, webinar. We wanted to give back to the community. So the title that we picked uh, for our first uh, webinar uh, under at Tesla, which is Affiliation of Tassel Alumni, was Panagogy, Way Forward, Challenges and Way Forward. And that was when um, I noticed people started to realize, oh, there is new, this, this new, you know, art of teaching, science of teaching, pedagogy, but there's not much literature. I suppose for you out there who are thirsty for research uh, and writing and presenting, you can start thinking about pedagogy. You know, you can start thinking about what you're doing now because people are trying to compile best practices during pedagogy. So I'm just already shouting out to you the things that you can do uh, in an area which is still a blue ocean, not yet a red ocean. People have been talking about pedagogy, andragogy, cybergogy for quite some time, but pedagogy is that blue ocean that many, maybe many of you could, you know, jump into and start 
writing about, researching about. And uh, following me discussing pedagogy, inshallah, I hope to be sharing with you our learners. Do we know our learners? Uh, dear friends, um, like what I've always told my students, um, when we want to teach, it is always, always rule number one that we must, 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 must know who our learners are. And when we talk about knowing our learners, it's not just knowing them by their names. And don't be, don't be proud saying that uh, you could memorize everybody's name and you can call them by their first name. But if that is all that you know about your learners, I fear that you may not be catering to their learning needs just as yet. Because there are more important things than just knowing their names and uh, recognizing their face. There are more to that. It's beyond that name, beyond, beyond those names and faces that you need to know about your learners. Inshallah, I will tell you a bit about that. But the gist of, our of my presentation today is more of that student empowerment. But again, I'm going to make disclaimer. You've already been informed about student empowerment. You've all your life as an educationist, you've been trained and been exposed to what student empowerment is. But allow me, uh, using this platform, to share with you student empowerment during a pandemic COVID-19 situation where we are teaching our students via ODL. And obviously, like what I would expect at the end of any training that I that I have gone to, I would say, so what? Then I've, I've listened to you and then what, what can I do with this? So having that in mind, I thought it'll be wise to also share with you some practical strategies. What are the things that you could do uh, during your lesson, uh, regardless of what subject you teach? You could be teaching in the, in the hotel, the tourism faculty, you could be teaching in the math and computer science faculty, you could be teaching in, in music faculty, you might be teaching in law faculty, regardless what subjects you teach, the practical strategies that I promised to share with you are generic enough that I am pretty sure you can employ in your lessons. Yeah, okay, let's start. Oh wow, look at this picture. I've, I, I was googling and then I saw this, this beautiful globe but surrounding the globe is that in is that mask and then there's a word written coronavirus then i said and look at look at that you know the string across the globe is as if it's confining it's confining the whole globe it's confining not just us in uitm it's not just confining us in uitm it's confining not just confining us in malaysia it's a whole wide world and hence the panic because suddenly it's a new norm People, remember when, when our Prime Minister first announced about the lockdown uh, and, and we had about a day before the actual lockdown, the lockdown was on Wednesday, Prime Minister announced it on Monday night. Did you remember what happened on Tuesday? People were doing that panic marketing, panic shopping. They were all panicky. Suddenly, gardenia bread. You don't see that. Five minutes was on the shelf. The next thing you look at the shelf, it's gone. You know, why? Panic. People were panic because we didn't know what to expect. We, did, we, were worst, we were imagining the worst and we were trying to prepare the worst with strategies that we know best. That is to just, you know, prepare and, and have things. But little that we know, some of the things that we did then were not necessary because uh, the government has promised us, don't worry, there'll still be food, there'll still be gardenia bread for everybody. There's no point buying too many things. You know, that's just one story about the bread. And there are many other things, you know, about panic attack. The rush to, to, to Balik Kampung, you know, and suddenly Plus Highway was heavily congested, whether up north or to the east coast. Uh, for no reason, people thought it was a holiday and then they went back and now they're stuck there. Uh, Wallah alam, you know. But the thing is, COVID-19 came to us by storm and made us in a situation unthought of. We never imagined something like this would have happened, but Allah has destined it, it has happened, and we have to accept it. And the thing, the thing though, um, one of the panic situations that I observed in the university, I don't know about other universities, but at least in UIT, and what I observed is that there was like a rush for training after training after training on the use of technology tools, you know. Uh, suddenly it became so famous uh, what to do uh, when you want to sort of like, you know, video your lecture. And then what about using your screen and doodling on your screen and then the use of bamboo, you know. And, and I, can, I can call one name, for example, Prof Karim. Uh, he's actually my mentor, a big, like a big brother uh, to me. He's one of those who is like really a warrior, you know, giving free uh, public tutoring 
tutorial on what to do using what application so that you can use those technology and still make your class interactive. Yes, uh, I, I see the point and I, I see, yes, wonderful. But then at the end of the day, I, I, I was thinking, hang on a minute, um, let's not jump into the bandwagon without realizing that we were just thinking about us. Uh, we, were, we have forgotten about our students. Our students may not be having the internet accessibility. So let alone using all of those technology. And then suddenly I saw the following week, I mellowed down a bit, people start talking about, okay, what to do, what, uh, what to do uh, in, your, in your teaching and learning with students with low bandwidth, with students with no internet. And then came along ideas on using WhatsApp, ideas on using, sorry, on using Telegram, ideas on using uh, even a simple SMS, you know? And then uh, luckily enough, I've got friends who are working in the Ministry of, of Education. And the, sad, the saddest story ever is that we tend to overlook the fact that we've got students who are in Sabah and Sarawak or don't have to go even too far away, even in Semenanjung, Malaysia, like in the, the most remote area that you can think of, whereby the only thing that, that, they, that we can depend on to, commu to communicate is the postman. And, and even that postman is just like once a week kind of, you know, uh, service in the respective village. So can you imagine um, the panic that we then felt so that, oh my God, you know, uh, there goes all this internet uh, related technology. Then, I, then, then uh, again, it came back to what I was already thinking from the very beginning, you know, when I was observing a few of my friends, even I also uh, went into some some webinar sessions with, with Prof Karim, trying to learn new things, new tricks with the technology. But then that was for us, you know, that was actually for us. The concern is what about the students? You know, they, they are, where are they? What resources do they have? have? Did we ever, have we ever thought about that? And then I came up, I came, I came about this, uh, this uh, quotation. It was from one of the online high education journal. And this is what, um, did a uh, dean, yeah, it was, he's a dean, she's a dean, Dean Bridget Long said, what we have learned, even as we've made this quick transition, it, she, was refer she was referring to the fact that we are rushing to, to understand uh, how to teach in this pandemic via ODL. Okay, I, I'm going to read it again. Even as we've made this quick transition, it's not to get bogged down with the technology, but to really think about pedagogy and engagement. That is the key word, engagement. Those are the central tenets, regardless of whether learning is face-to-face -face or online. Aha, so when, when and, and I observed the, after the first two or three weeks, people started to slow down, and then they started to realize, hey, it's the student. We need to check on the student. And there were surveys done, and there were, there were many initiatives done to know where are our students. Uh, do they have enough? I mean, on top of their basic survival, uh, needs, yeah, like food and health-wise, but when it comes to their teaching and learning, do they have the resources? Are they with the internet accessibility? Do they have a laptop? Uh, of course, they've got a phone, but do their, I mean, do their, do their phones would be able to, you know, be that platform for them to follow your, your, your classes? Um, all those that you have learned using all those tools, technology tools, would that be irrelevant? So that brings me to this beautiful, um, you know, a diagram I saw that uh, in one of my friends uh, uh, Facebook yeah and there's a wonder of Facebook and, and friends so I saw this in one of my friends Facebook and I thought wow this is so true I mean you have so much effort invested in and you've learned about all the tools that you can think of and you try to 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 employ that in your class you thought you are ready uh, to face ODL when your students could be anywhere from Perlis to Sabah or even could be out of the country but i don't think so because we were locked down right but at the end of the day there's no results you know uh it's kind of a sad sad thing isn't it you've got that and then you've got that and suddenly oh dear uh, so again another panic attack came about all right so hence ladies and gentlemen my um, respected friends come the term pedagogy now what is pedagogy now i'm sharing with you this photo because they deserve the credit. On the left, the one in black is Jesse Stommel, and on the right, the one in red is Sean Michael Morris. Now, who are they? Sean Michael Morris is the director of Digital Pedagogy Lab in the School of Education and Human Development, University of Colorado, Denver. 
The one on the left is uh, Jesse Stommel. He's a senior lecturer and digital language fellow at the University of Mary, Washington. So you can imagine that these people are ICT, IET savvy, you know, but they are the ones who actually coined the term pedagogy. And you know when they did that? On the 1st of April, 2020. They have this platform where they made, they made it uh, open, uh, accessible via the internet. Maybe you can Google that later. It's called the 24-hour office. 24-hour office, if you Google that, yeah? So that is when they invite uh, educators, you know, preschool to higher education, educators to come and join them to discuss about the panic attacks and way forward when it comes to still continuing our teaching, regardless of whether we are with our students in the classroom or whether we are apart. So they were the ones who, term the, who coined the term pedagogy. And what is pedagogy? Okay, this... There is, there is also this journal, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, where professors discuss the weirdness of teaching remotely in a pandemic. It's not just teaching remotely, but it's also teaching in a pandemic. Now, when the word, the, the word pandemic is also mentioned, let's not just uh, quickly jump into the bandwagon saying that, oh, this is just like what we had in the 70s and the 80s, PJJ, you know, Pendidikan Jarak Jauh. Or, or distance learning. Yeah, but that was when there was no pandemic. Uh, here, we're talking about teaching remotely in a pandemic where mobility is very, very, um, what do you call that, constrained. So if you imagine your student can go out, get materials, and go to the library, get some things, and follow your classes via distant learning, like what was in the 70s and the 80s or early 90s, that's totally wrong. You know, pedagogy is not just distant learning. It's not just remote teaching. It's actually remote teaching in a pandemic. So hence, there is this need to empathize and sympathize and I think the words gonna, gonna come uh, in the next slide is the word compassionate but let's not when the three later I'm gonna uh, introduce to you the, uh, the, the, the uh, adjectives later yeah so what we are trying to say here is not actually not online learning yeah remember we were saying about maybe students do not have those resources the, access, the internet accessibility but it's actually remote instruction and I like to bring your attention to the word instruction instruction not teaching it's not remote teaching yes we are teachers but we don't teach we are actually learning designers if you recall um in the 2018 and in the 2019 there was so much debate about we are learning designers you know where we design the learning experience for our students uh, so we're not just facilitating their learning. We are designing our students' learning experience because learning is a journey. Learning is a, it's a process. Learning is something which the students will experience and it has to be impactful and meaningful. So hence, the, the buzzword then was learning designers. So proud are we that we say that we are learning designers. So when we are learning designers, we design the relevant activities. We, we design the relevant tasks. So... Coming to my, my next point when I talk about pedagogy is the fact that the first thing, remember just now I said when we want to start thinking and planning about our teaching, we must first think of our students. So now when you are teaching remotely in a pandemic, yeah, in a pandemic, the first question that we should ask our students is to assume that you are like, remember in the 80s we've got this uh, tele, tele, uh, TV, TV series, uh, Fantasy Island, a whole... Uh, a whole uh, aeroplane crashed and everybody was deserted on an island and they call it the fantasy island. So what they did was to scout around and see what are the resources available. So likewise, in our context, in our situation, we are in our own house, our students are either at the college or in their own respective uh, parents' house or in, you know, some, some, somewhere, but distant from you, is to ask what resources do you have? So had we not done that, and then suddenly we rush into learning all those technology. Oh my goodness, I think we just made the first mistake. But luckily, those mistakes can be undone. You can rectify, you know, uh, so don't worry. And I, think, and I think that is why we are all here. Eh? So the first thing that we ask is as if we are on a desert island and we ask our students, what are our resources? What are your resources? So on and so forth. And the thing about pedagogy, you are trying you are experimenting, you are trying, you're experimenting, it's working, it's not working, it's working for some, it's not working for some. Basically speaking, 
there is no empirical or scientific theories or manual or any operational methods that have gone through ADI in defining and in describing and in you know really illustrating pedagogy, unlike pedagogy and andragogy. So in, in the past, all the design that we have, sorry, all the things that we have done is actually by design. But now what is happening to us is by chance. It's unfortunately a chance that we wish we, we do that, that we do not have, but we are actually having that, that, that scenario, yeah, the pandemic. So the thing about pedagogy earlier, remember I mentioned about the, the sympathy, but actually it's more than just sympathy. In pedagogy, it's likely us asking more and more questions, but all those questions are all central to these three things. We are to find creative solution, we are to find compassionate solution, and we are to find generative solution. And who said this? This is that Morris guy. The Sean Michael Morris, who's the director of Digital Pedagogy Lab at the School of Education and Human Development in the University of Colorado, Denver. He, he was the one who said that. So whatever you do, you know, uh, you have asked your students what resources they have. So based on what resources they have, that is when we need to find that creative, compassionate and generative solution. And it's, it's a call, it's, it's a time for critical pedagogy and for some it's critical digital pedagogy it's digital because you are lucky you're lucky because your students have the accessibility to the internet and they've got anything that you can imagine to have in their own house you know uh, they could have the internet you've got the printer they've got the uh, wide uh, you know uh, bandwidth uh, no problem they can google for you they can download youtube for you whatever that you make them do that is critical digital uh, pedagogy but the thing is Remember the first question I posed just now is who are your learners, right? What do they have? And then Morris said, ask your students what resources do they have? So it's time for critical pedagogy. It always, it always and will always be about questions and likely more questions. At that point of time, I can't but have to think that, oh wow, this is us, the, the chance that we're waiting for, you know, we, where we can break free from the mundane, norm we had years after years semesters after semesters you know where you can be really creative and try out uh, new strategies you know uh, especially when there's a lot of compassion from our top management saying that okay this uh, you know we have several sessions so that you you need to like you, you you're given extra time to the syllabus don't worry we've got uh, no uh, when the students come back then you can you can continue with, with there is a need for the face-to-face -face kind of activities and so on and so forth. So to me, I take that as a positive sign that there is freedom given to us. At the end of the day, education is all about practice of freedom. If you recall Pablo Freire, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Pablo Freire. He came with that book, you know, uh, Pedagogy for the Oppressed. You know, he was referring to his uh, Brazilians um, who were oppressed by the colonies, yeah, the British colonies, where they were decided on what they could learn and how they could learn. So Pablo Ferrer for, for his people and saying, no, uh, we need to be liberated. You know, our, our, our young ones need to be liberated. So he came up with, it, with his own curriculum and, and so on and so forth. So if you have time, do find Pablo Ferrer and read his book. He has three books, uh, series, they're all related to um, freedom, of the, uh, freedom of the Oppressed and how to teach uh, he talk, and and he gave birth to ideas like uh dialogic pedagogy which i'm quite a big fan too so what you he if you were to follow pablo Ferreira, he's saying that education is about liberating the minds of the students as well as the teachers and uh if you recall uh, uh pedagogy andragogy teaching is actually both art and science that's both art and science in teaching the scientific of it would come from best practices, research-based findings, but art is it's very unique because teaching is very, what do you call that, is very individual. It's between you and your own students because whatever I have with my own students may not be the same with you and your students. So if you want to emulate or, or, or emulate my lesson plan, you may need to uh, amend or, or modify to, to meet the needs of your learners. So that is why um, there's a lot of uh, you know, decision-making throughout the, the journey of teaching and learning. So there is never one lesson plan that would fit all the classes that you teach. There's always changes that you need to do. So when we're talking about those changes, you know, a lot of thinking, it's about liberating the minds of students, not just students, but also teachers. And the best part when we talk about this is we are fostering critical consciousness. 
Now, when we're talking about critical consciousness, you know, I hope at this point of time, uh, fellow colleagues, you are also thinking about how are we actually training our students to become responsible citizens, to become independent uh, learners, you know, uh, and, and someone who can be proud of themselves. And, and for every decision that they make, they know the implication and they are ready to, to be responsible for, for whatever implication that would come about based on the decision that they've made. So that is fostering critical consciousness that we are aware that whatever we decide, whatever we make our students do and whatever we allow our students to decide, both the students and us are ready for whatever that outcome is. But at the end of the day, as long as our nawaitu is just one, that is to go for a common purpose, which is to ensure learning does take place nonetheless, inshallah, uh, the pathway is a clear and smooth sailing one. Of course, there'll be glitches here and there, but that's part of learning, isn't it? Because we do have mistakes, we do, do, we do make mistakes, but that's the beauty of it. We learn from our mistakes. The problem is when we don't learn from our mistakes. Okay, now I promise you to know our students. Uh, this is an interesting uh, image I found also from the internet, you Google, uh, Mr. Google, eh? these are some of the photos, but I choose this one in particular because I like the fact that learner is put in the middle of the ring and learners are the three things. That is, you must know your learners. Look at those uh, palm prints, you know, all the colors, the different colors. If I were to interpret this, I interpreted it as the diversity, the diversity that we have within our classroom. Now, when they were with you, some 25 of them or maybe some 40 of them in your class, you see them as a whole group of whatever your group, uh, the class name is. But the, the, the truth is actually you shouldn't be looking at them as a whole group. You need to see them as individual. And that is why whenever we, uh, when we train our students in the Faculty of Education, one of the first few things we make them realize is to know who their learners are. And there are many diagnostic tests that we can do to know who they are. Some of the things that we need to know about them besides their names and where they are from and why they are in our program and what are their hobbies, what do their parents do and what not, or some social economy status, those are common ones. But what we actually want to know more about learners is actually their learning styles. How do they prefer to learn? Learning styles, there are a variety of learning styles. And then from that learning styles, then we get to decide to match it with our personality as their instructor, as their teacher. So remember I said earlier, teaching is actually a joint process where student and teacher actually learn from each other. We co-construct the knowledge together, co-curate the knowledge together. And, the learn and that is why you are the learning designer because you are the, wi the wisest of all uh, when you get to design the path you know, uh, uh, in the journey of learning. So it's, it's very important that we know if there are 40 of them, you need to know all the 40 learning styles. But the good thing about learning styles is that it's identifiable uh, and you can group. Uh, when I say there are 40 students, it doesn't mean there are 40 different learning styles. You can actually find a few students having similar preferred learning style. And why is it so important to know, to know their learning style? Inshallah, I'll, I'll share with you in a, in a while. Okay, to the left is actually your course. Of course, the reason why your university, your school or your institution have has hired you is because you are the master in your in your course. No one would deny that. You know your course. You know, um, in 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 literature we call this as the you know a TPAC where you know the uh, the PCK yeah? pedagogy content knowledge. You know your you have your knowledge. You know the content knowledge of the course and you know the pedagogy content knowledge. You know how to teach the the subject and. Uh, on top of PCK, we also have TPCK, which stands for Technology, Pedagogy, Content Knowledge. When we, when we start talking about computer in education, you know, uh, internet uh, in education and whatnot. But then again, the one in the bottom, uh, in, below there, A and B and the tick there, know what to do. Aha, this is the challenge actually. So now that you know who your learners are, in particular their preferred learning styles, and then you know your course obviously. How do you bring these two together, match that with your personality, with your teaching style, so that you give your best? One of the things that I like to, is my tagline, I like to tell my students whenever they do their assignments, whenever they do their projects, I say, I would say this, give your best. Give your best. So how do we ensure that we have given our best? And one of the things that first, we must know our learners. Number two, inshallah, you already know your subject matter your course but having this in mind 
inshallah we need to know what to do and i think the very reason why we are here together this morning sharing this platform together is to know what else to do how else can we do things yeah inshallah okay remember i promised you uh the types of learners i'm sure many of you would have seen this many 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 times um so but um if it on the dark, maybe a few of you have yet to really understand what they actually are. Okay, basically, in general speaking, learners can be divided into three big uh, preferred learning styles. Yeah? Auditory learner, we've got the visual learner, and we've got the kinesthetic learner. But the, the beauty of it, you know, Allah has created uh, student, uh, people with the respective DNA in our, in our blood. We are different, we are very unique in the sense that some of these types of learning style can overlap. You know, that's why you've got that visual auditory learner. You could also have visual kinesthetic learner. You can have kinesthetic auditory learner. You could also have a learner who's all three, visual auditory kinesthetic. And you're very lucky when you've got all three. But the, the reason why I highlight the fact that students may have different preferred learning style, there's a good reason to it. It's because you need to know how to cater to their learning style, knowing that these are their preferred learning style. So what can you do to facilitate their learning? So my next slide is actually also from, from the internet. I've, I'm sharing with you the uh, source, and you can Google that later, because I'm sorry for the writing, it might be too little for you to read, but if you go to the source that I'm sharing with you, you can you know uh, zoom out and see what are the things that you can do. So the first one, uh, that you can see on the top right, sorry, top left, visual or special. These students, uh, students with this preferred learning style, they like pictures, they like images, they like special, uh, special understanding. When we talk about special understanding, we're talking about the job, the 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 physicality of things, the 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 location of things. You know, that's why they are good with maps, directions. You know, uh, you know, having having that satellite uh, view to things, and they can see things from an aerial view. Oral learners or auditory musical learners, they prefer sound and music. Uh, sound and music, they, they like listening, you know, they, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't mind you talking most of the time and, and they find pleasure in jotting down whatever you say, taking down notes, yeah? These are the oral learners. And then we also have the social learners. I mean, I would be one of those, I assume. Uh, social learners is the kind of students who like to interact. They like to be in groups. It, it will kill them if you don't make them move about in the class and, and pair work or do group work and, and whatnot. Verbal linguistic are students who prefer uh, words, uh, both in speech and in writing, you know. Uh, so these are the, the students who actually uh, appreciate when you encourage a lot of uh, speaking in the class, a lot of writing in the class, and then if you make them read something and then you ask them to give their thoughts on what they have read, that these are the students who would benefit. Uh, from that kind of uh, teaching strategies, yeah? And then we've got the physical students uh, or the kinesthetic. These are the ones who, who would like to move and then you don't make them just sit on their chair for the two hours that you have with them. So these are the ones who actually like to use their their hands. They like to do, they, they like to model, they like to demo, they, they like to come up front and uh, do that public speaking where they can point to their margin paper or their poster or their, they can share their, uh, PowerPoint and you know stuff like that. They really like to just jump out of this of their chair and and just mingle, you know. And solitary, or, uh, solitary, sorry, solitary. The intrapersonal students. Uh, these are the ones who you see that they're quiet. They tend to be on their own. They they love to work alone. It kills them sometimes when you make them come up front and do unlike the the social or the the kinesthetic uh, type of learners. The solitary students will find a lot of challenge to do uh, public speaking, you know, uh, or to even to stand up and give their thoughts. Uh, so those are the solitary learners. And we also have the logical mathematical students. These are the students who actually they prefer logic, reasoning and systems. Not, we're not just talking about math here. I'm talking about whenever you give a lecture, they would at the back of their mind ask the logic behind it. What's the reason for this? Why, why are we doing this? They need the justification and they need to have the structure. They want to see this. there's a system to whatever that you are providing as input to them. So those are the logical mathematical students. Yeah? Now, coming back to this pandemic COVID-19, when we are doing ODL, when we are apart in a distance, whether via internet, you are lucky, you can use your uh, Google Classroom or Webinet, or, uh, what do you call that, WebEx, or, or even here, Google Meet, you could also have your WhatsApp, you know, where you record yourself and then you ask the students to uh, 
uh, speak up also and whatnot. The thing is, I hope you realize there's a lot of advantage to the auditory students because they like listening, yeah? Like, like what you guys are doing now, you are using a lot of listening skills. So if you are the oral students or the auditory musical students, this is a this is a this is a blast, you know. This is this is such a bliss. You 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 are enjoying it because you're sitting there and listening. But for those students who are kinesthetic, for those students who are social, interpersonal, for students who are verbal, this is actually a challenge, you know. So what I'm trying to spark your first interest is to start thinking about how have you been teaching them the last few weeks, the moment we we, we resume our semester. I know, uh, or for those who have yet to take, yeah, because I was informed UIA were given 10, 10 weeks of midterm break, and they, could only, they would only resume after 10 weeks since the beginning of the MCO. So maybe you're preparing already what, how to conduct your classes then, I mean by the time. So have you thought about this? This is an advantage to the oral students, you know, this is an advantage to the um, solitary students. But what about the others? What about the social students? What about the physical students or the kinesthetic students? What about the verbal and, and, and the rest? You know, uh, start thinking. Inshallah, I have some ideas at the end if you bear with me. Yeah? And student empowerment, the gist. What is student uh, empowerment? When we talk about empowerment, we're talking about empowering our student. We're talking about uh, rendering that responsibility from the shoulder of the teacher to the student. So it's actually a process of creating intrinsic motivation. And how do we do that? Via impactful elements and tasks that increase our students' sense of control. Ooh, I can imagine some of you are already jittery. Oh, how can we do that? Uh, you know, I'm teaching this course. It's very demanding a course. I don't think I can do that. Hang on, it's pandemic COVID-19, remember? That's pedagogy. This is, this is all pedagogy happening. At the end of the day, they, you won't be with them forever, correct? Eventually, they will graduate and life will be there, will be out there. The sun will be shining upon them without you by their side, nonetheless. So if here you are saying that, I can't do that, I can't let, let it go, I can't transfer that responsibility to my students, that my, my subject is a demanding subject, I, I think you need to reconsider your expectations at the end of your subject, at the end of your course, at the end of the 14 weeks that you have with your students, are you still going to be there for them, you know? Because if we are true educators, if we are true teachers, we need to actually provide that experience for our students that they gradually build their confidence, gradually build their independence, and they can fly higher. In fact, they can be a better person than we are. Because I remember, this is Marco Polo, yeah? Marco Polo. Um, I was I was at Hong Kong Airport. Sajen, I will say you all. MC only check up some traveling. Yeah, I was at Hong Kong Airport and I saw at Starbucks there was this uh, blackboard and there was a there was a, a quotation from Marco Polo and it's it stays in my mind forever. And for those students who, if you were once my students, you have you would have heard me saying this. Poor is a master whose pupil is not better than him. So what I'm trying to say here, what Marco Polo is trying to say here is that. Who are you as a master or as a teacher if your students are just equally like you, nothing better than you, you know, or, or you, you are still better than them? So you have not done any training that you have not done any educating or liberating, liberating the minds of your student there. So back to learning empowerment, we're talking about, about using intrinsic motivation. The key word is intrinsic, you know, motivation, there are extrinsic, external factors that drive us, but what is more sustainable, what is more... Uh, you know, um, uh, could stay forever is actually the intrinsic reason, intrinsic motivation from within, not forced by external factors, but from within. And how do we, uh, what do you call that? How do we tap on the intrinsic motivation? Obviously, through impactful elements and tasks that increase students' sense of control. So the control, gradual uh, handing over of the control of the, the learning to the students. And I came about this one. I was listening to Prof. Rusna Awang Hashim's uh, webinar hosted uh, by Prof. Karim. Uh, so Prof. Rusna uh, had this slide on her slide. So I'm sharing with you the slide from Prof. Rusna, who actually got it from that source, the one that you can see down below there. This is from Howard Gardner. I'm sure it's a name that I need no introduction. And according to Howard Gardner, he said, 
you will learn at your best when you have something you care about and can get pleasure in being engaged in. And for those psychologists out there, you know, I know there are some of you who are, who are psychologists, I'm sure you have heard of the word flow, F-L-O-W, flow. And maybe some of us who are into reading about educational psychology, you, you, you are familiar with the word flow. Flow like that stream, you know, in the river flowing, you know, that, that is one kind of flow. But the flow that we have here in educational psychology refers to the engagement, the absorption, how, how you are immersed in one uh, activity that you forgot about the world because you are so engrossed in that activity. And that is why when people have flow, they, they tend to forget about time. They didn't realize it has already been three hours that passed by, you know. You, you've gone through that, I'm sure. There are times when you were doing something and then the next thing you look at the watch, hey, it's already four hours that you've been doing that. You didn't realize because it was so enjoyable. So again, why was it so enjoyable? Because you had that flow. There was, it was such a pleasure to you and, and, and you, you were loving every second of it and you didn't realize that the, 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 the time has passed. And another interesting slide, also from Prof. Rusna Awang Hashim, uh, is this model, yeah? It's music model. I like the word music model, academic motivation uh, from Jones, yeah, 2009. If you Google Jones, uh, she, she is an educational psychologist and she specializes on academic motivation. And from her years and years of research, you know, and best practices, she came up with this model, which she called music, which stands for M, empowerment, U, usefulness, S, success, I, interest, and C, caring. So if you read on the columns that, that come below each of those alphabets, empowerment is like the students believe that they have some control over some aspect of their learning. So these are some questions that they could have is that what choice do I have? So over here, as their teacher sitting at the other side of the table, sitting as their teacher, how do you make the students feel empower, empowered? Do you give choices? For example, you give them a task, does that task encourage choices, alternatives? Uh, you know, uh, could, I mean, we're talking about solutions, right? Could there be more than just one solution that you look for from them? So do they have choices? And not just choices in terms of solution. In, you know, in doing, in, in, in um, what do you call that? In doing the task, do they have choices on how to do the task? Or do they have to go by your way? So if it is by your way, Allah, I don't think, uh, you are empowering your students just yet, you know. So the first questions your students will ask if you want them to feel empowered, they have to have choices. They need to feel that they have choices. So when they, when they need to feel that they have choices, you have to give them choices in terms of how to how the how to do the task and the solutions that they could come up with. You usefulness understand why the content is relevant and valuable. The questions the students would ask if you want them to feel empowered is that. Why do I want to do this? Yeah? yeah, you want to do it. Okay, but why would I want to do it? The, the students, I mean, we were one students too, right? Remember when our lecturers, our teachers asked us to do something? I'm sure more than once you would say in your heart, of course, you would say, why am I doing it? Okay, she asked us to do it, we do it. You know, when that happens, yeah, nothing, no empowerment has taken place. Because if you want to, in, if you want to, if you want to, um, you know, spark, their intrinsic motivation, it must come from within. The students must believe that there is usefulness in whatever that they do. So the students need to see that there is a reason why they are doing this. And I will give you some ideas later how to make our students see the reason why they do it and eventually, inshallah, they, they want to do it. Yeah. And as is success, the question that they would have is that, can I do it? Oh my God, this is too tough a task. Can I do it? Especially I'm alone here in this village. You know, my, the closest friend that I have is some 100 kilometers away and I need to call him or her, you know? So especially in, during the pandemic uh, situation, yeah, COVID-19 situation, when students are apart from each other, they are apart from each other, interacting with each other is quite a constraint. Uh, they need to make a phone call or they need to text their friend and, and, and the immediacy of the response is not, like what we could imagine if they are together in, in the camp, on campus. So here under S is that the students need to believe that they can succeed with effort, you know, competence, perception. And I for interest, uh, question that it was like, that they would ask that, do I like it? You know, the students need to feel that they're interested in what they are supposed to be learning. And I think this one would go with 
with you and the usefulness, yeah? And C, caring. Ah, remember when we have our subject, our course, there's always that CLO, that course learning outcomes, you know, we've got our entrance survey, we've got our exit survey, we make our students respond to entrance at the beginning of the semester, and they respond again at the end of the semester, similar question, they need to tick, they need to confirm whether they have achieved uh, you know, uh, at the end and, and prior to coming into the semester, they need to confirm uh, where are they at their stand, what, uh, how good are they at, achieve, at, doing, uh, the, I mean, at doing the learning outcomes that we've listed. So this, this course, the next 14 weeks, will train them so that by the time, inshallah, what they have uh, rated them themselves in the beginning of the semester, when they rated themselves again at the end via the exit entrance survey, so we what we imagine is that there will be a, 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 a growth yeah, in, in uh, a development in their ability. So, but that is so beautiful on paper, but in real life, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm just you know throwing you some some critical thoughts, you know, for you to really, really, really consider. Do do you give your students the impression that you are interested with the attainment of their learning outcomes? not just because they have filled up the entrance and the exit survey only, but do you, you as their teacher, do you make the students feel that you want to see that they have achieved that outcome, not because of the survey, but this is why they are there in your class. And this is why you spent 14 weeks with them, you know, uh, so that social presence, that relatedness, where they can, they, the students believe, they feel it that, that you care whether they have achieved or meet the CLOs. Okay, I'm coming to the fourth section of my presentation, and I think I'm doing quite good. It's already 20 past. Uh, give me about 10 minutes, inshallah, or less to do this, yeah? So just now, I promised you some practical strategies, right? And I promise you that they, they are generic ones that whatever subject you teach, inshallah, you, you'll be able to employ them. But then again, these are suggestions. I am an outsider giving you suggestions, but you are the person in charge of your students and your course and the CLO's attainment. And also to, to develop your, your students to become manusia, yeah? uh, to become human, human beings, uh, uh, to, to become human, sorry. So the first one is that when we, when we, when we talk about teaching, you know, uh, now we're talking about PDPC, yeah? uh, Pembelajaran dan Pemudah Caraan, and Facilitation of Learning. You know, it's not, te it's not teaching and learning, it's facilitation and learning. So, obviously, you will have to plan. And the first thing that, remember, I, I told you about knowing your, your, knowing your learners. So, when you know your learners, for example, you know their learning styles, so you start to, to uh, you know, uh, have a variety of teaching materials and whatnot. That's already planning. But what I also like to suggest is that I always hold strongly to this formula. I call it the three P's. Uh, you know, this is my, my own buzzword. You know, my students don't remember. I'm sure some of them will be, will be smiling now. You know, the three P's. What are the three P's? Present, practice, and produce. In a complete lesson, we have these three P's. You don't have all the three P's, then your lesson is not complete. The first one is present is where... We, we give our students the in, our input the, as the teacher. Your, your memory to what we have uh, when we say formative assessment. Formative assessment are all the tasks and activities that we do in our class, but they are not meant for grading. They are meant for us to see the need to we need to to provide more input, you know. So the second P, which is practice, if I may put that as formative assessment, the things that you the things that you make your students do, um, you know, the activities that they do, and then you observe them, and then you see whether they've 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 progressed well or they have not yet progressed to a level which you expected, then that means you have to go back and go back to the first P, pre present, where you need to provide more teacher input. And, and the third P is produce, where the students eventually come up. Uh, if you remember Bloom's taxonomy, the peak of the pyramid is creation, right? Create. So the produce here is when students are able to make use of the knowledge or the information or the skills that you have 
uh, expose them with or train them with to come up with their their own uh, creation and innovation yeah uh, where they can come up with something and the thing about teaching via uh, pandemic is compassion the word was compassion that was mentioned earlier so we have been suggested to have our lesson in modular format so here i like to suggest to you the other users will have more than 14 and what we know in 14 weeks is that we've got our scheme of work so when it is scheme of work, we've got our topic and then and and you know the activities to be done in that week. But that is during normal time. But here is the new norm. Look again at your last, at your scheme of work, the 14 weeks. Look at all those topics. Look at the CLOs. Uh, look at the the learning objectives. Sorry, the the topic uh, objectives. Sometimes, if it was well designed, if your course was well designed, we believe in spiral curriculum. Yeah. Where certain things are, are recy recyclable, they can be they can be exposed and they can be introduced in several weeks together. You know, uh, so look again. You are the teacher here. You are the wiser one here. You are the content expert here. Look again. What can you put together so that it will not be taking too long for you, like having the luxuries of time that you can meet them anytime because they're all all of you are on campus, but no, you're not. So start thinking about chunking. And not just chunking, look at the sequencing. Because when we talk about sequencing, we're talking about what should they know first before they are able to do the next one. And once they have known that, they need to know that before they do the other one. So what I'm trying to say here is Lemon's term is mastery learning. What do they need to master first before they go to the second one and the third one and the fourth one? And when you de when you when you design such, eh, the, the, when you sequence the topics, remember modular chunking them, you need to remember, do not, when I, when I say chunking, I'm not saying that put two, three topics together. It's not about putting two, three topics together, yeah? Look at the learning outcomes. Le learning outcomes, yeah? And when we talk about... hours with, uh, with them them with you for two or three hours provide them with something like they can hold on to at that distance where you could have a demo manual an infographic you need to start being creative uh, probably you do your mind mapping you know your notes uh, in mind map uh, and the idea of chunking just now and the beauty of mind mapping is that where you can see the connection so when the students look at your mind map they can they can see the connection of the learning outcome from that topic is to, together put with this topic because the learning outcomes are quite similar, you know, and, and whatnot. And the, that mind map is an example of you providing maybe every beginning of a topic, every, you've got 14 weeks before you, and then every beginning of a week, you've got that mind map example, if, if it's a mind map, or any infographic. Uh, you may have a table, and then um, you may, uh, not just a table, you may have a tree diagram, you know, a tree diagram with branches, see, branch, branch, branching here and there and then and whatnot. But for a more mature students, probably you have some of uh, uh, some blanks where they need to fill up. Uh, you know, when they do their readings of the re re relevant assigned chapters, then they fill up your mind map. So that's why I've got the word provide jigsaw. Jigsaw as if like uh, you give some and a few they have to find. You know, and follow along. And the tasks and activities, of course, we've got that non face to face here. Yeah? And the good thing about uh, non face to face, we can record it. Uh, whatever that we do, we record, and then we can have that synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, so, but then again, I like to remind us, especially me, it has to depend on our students' resources. You know, here I'm talking as if students, everybody has the internet, but consider those. You know, we've we've read some reports from Bahagian Halewal Academy in YTM, yeah, looking at our students in Sarap, in Sabah, and in Sarawak or even in Kelantan and Trungganu where, where they are in their village where the, the nearest place that they could go is to climb a hill to be to the nearest uh, tower to get internet connection and some of them would go to by the river God knows why there's a river, the river is a good spot for internet connection some of them had to to you know um, to go to the neighbor's kitchen you know because the neighbor's kitchen is the, the nearest with the, with the internet mm -hmm. You know that that happened. You know, we've read that in our in the report that uh, Bahagian Halal Academy shared with us, and I'm sure it's not just 
individual to UITM, I'm sure in other universities or in other institutions also you have stories like that, yeah? So when we talk about here, is that um, bear in mind how important time management is for the students because they cannot be sitting by the river for two, three hours. They cannot be sitting on top of the hill for two, three hours to follow your lecture for two, three hours. So what I'm trying to say is that though in your schedule says it's a two hour class, please bear in mind you cannot hold them for two hours, especially via, via ODL like this. You need, that's why the idea of chunking and sequencing. But having said that, I came about um, one FB, uh, viral by one student saying that, you know, they are doing six subjects in a semester and all six lectures are giving them tasks and it's never ending, even weekend also they receive WhatsApp and whatnot. But then again, um, I think that is one student where we need to educate because life never just, you, you don't just put things in boxes, separate boxes and one, yes, we deal one box at a time, but sometimes there is a need for multitasking, there's a need for time management, but at the end of the day also, not just a student, we also need to educate ourselves as the teachers to, to compassionate, you know, the word compassionate again, to really understand, see things from the student's perspective. You need to know, oh, they're doing six other subjects besides your subject, or they're doing eight subjects besides your subject, or these are repeating students, wallah alam. So you need to, to really cater to the needs of the learners, yeah? And what I'm suggesting also is to have a checklist of what students should be able to do by the end of the lesson. And in terms of empowering our students, not just our learning outcomes. Remember earlier uh, from, at the beginning of my talk, I shared with you the training outcomes. And then I said, why don't you now write down on a piece of paper your goals? Because when we do that, it's actually your goals, the one that you want to know, the one that you want to attain. It's what you want. The one that I listed earlier were what I imagined would be best for everybody that follows this, this, this talk that I'm hosting now. And that is also me as, as the trainer. This is my target. But it's not just about me. It's also about the students. It's also about the participants. So hence, I ask you to uh, jot down what are your goals uh, upon attending this seminar. And we're going we're gonna to visit those listed goals of yours later. And I'm also suggesting that we have a lesson inventory for students' self-assessment. So what you can do to encourage empowerment to your students is that uh, for them to have their own inventory. You know, when you start a topic, maybe that topic is in a week's time. Maybe that topic is in a two weeks time. At the end of that topic, whether it's within a week time or after, or after two weeks time, go to that lesson inventory that, you've, that you requested your students to come up with for them to assess or to rate uh, their their development, their own development, you know, from the beginning when you started in week one or, or if it's just one week on Monday and assuming your class is on Wednesday, but Monday you've already put up something, you've already shared something, they'll be reading things and then on, on Wednesday you give them a task and they have to submit, that is your formative assessment, the tasks and activities and by Friday probably you you ask them, you know, but make it casually, casually, don't make it as if it's like assignment, 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 you know, uh, do it casually and um, in fact, uh, I, I trainee student who was teaching in Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Alam and, and doing via ODL, she asked me how would she teach, you know, then I said follow the school instruction and they were doing all that WhatsApp and Telegram and whatnot. But then my question to her was that how do you ensure the students are actually doing things? And then she said, I'm doing a checklist. And the checklist was done individually. Then I told her, why are you doing this individually? Because it, 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 it's as if you have to do, if there are 40 students, it's 40 different checklists. So what you can do is perhaps do a grid, you know, for, for the whole class. You prepare the grid and for the students to tick. This is where they, they identify. And when they do that, you are teaching them honesty, you are teaching them integrity, you are teaching them responsibility. Because if they think that they, have, they are able to do this already, they are able to do this already, your topic, the second topic, would depend on what they would know from the first topic. If they are struggling the second topic, then you can go back to that grid and say, hello, uh, you know, going back. Then they, the students realize, oh, okay, I need to be careful. I need to know that uh, these are when I, I decide something, it has implication and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, moving on is uh, when we teach, when we have our sessions now, I like this word, less is more. Uh, dear respected friends, less is more. Do less teacher talk. Uh, you don't have the luxury of them sitting right before you for two or three hours to listen to you. Yeah? Do less teacher talk. There is a change in the role of interaction. And the interaction is a lot of written. 
And for some who are luxurious enough to have the internet, you can have your Google Classroom, so you can have the students talking to you, you know, and they can, you can have students talking to each other, you know, when you've got your Google Classroom. Uh, I, I use Webex, actually, so you have all, if there are 25 of them, you see all the 25 faces, and then when it's time to speak, they would, they would unmute the mic, and then we can use our chat, uh, you know, they can, they can, they can, what do you call that? Uh, type type in their, their comments and this is actually uh, advantages to the shy ones to the individual ones you know they they, they are following you they're observing you but they are chatting because they, they are not the fly guy they, they are they are they are quite embarrassed to, to stand out but for the communicative ones the social ones is now the interactive ones is now wow they like it you know they will be they will be the ones who would be like keying in and then uh, unmuting them and asking your permission to unmute their mic and to see something you know, uh, even if it's not during Webex or Google Classroom, via WhatsApp, you know, they can, they can video record, uh, sorry, they can uh, voice record, you know, do the voice recording and whatnot, and so and so forth. All right, and what I have next is that um, I, I'm suggesting that we give empowerment to our students where we suggest that they start diary, you know, dear diary kind of a thing, but this is for academic purposes. It's like a learning log where they, they but it has to come with a clear instruction what do they have in that learning log or the diary. We don't want them to become too personal and like, you know, quite uh, jiwang. Huh? What we want them to write is actually, when you give them a task, what did they do? What challenges did they face? And, and what strategies do they, do they, do they employ eh, to overcome that? So probably, that, and, and, and a compilation of that learning log where they detail out how they actually do the task that you do. Uh, in a way, if I were to be you, I'll already see an opportunity and by the end of the semester, if you have 25 students, you've got 25 learning log, that is your data, that is your publication, <laughs> that is your best practices paper that you can come up with, you know. Another option that I have here is portfolio, where the students, you know, portfolio is like a compilation. You ask them to come up with a folder, and then they start to, you know, compile uh, when, because it's a lot of independent reading, independent uh, search engine yeah, where they uh, look for information even whatsapp or even telegram messages you know they can compile and put that in their portfolio it's like a, a, a an archive of their materials and i was also thinking about let's 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 tap on the right bright the right side of the brain and eh, the right hemisphere which is the, the creative ones let's come up with a scrapbook you know where they can for every experience that they go through, you know, Monday to Friday or over the weekend, you know, they can take some photos, you know, they, they're sitting by their, uh, by their dining table with a coffee uh, by the side and they are doing, they are doing the formula, they are practicing the formula that you are asking them to do and then put that, that's like, you know, it's a journey, right? So, scrapbook is that creativity uh, aspect of them documenting their journey and, and, and that journey is actually their learning journey. And another one which I like to do also is post a presentation. Like at the end of a phase in my, uh, for example, I take my, my, my subject. At the end of a phase, for example, we've got 14 weeks. I've got some three or four weeks uh, together. And at the end of that fourth week, in the fifth week, I make my students present a poster. Uh, that poster is actually their sum the summary of the topics that we've covered. And I make them present. And that is when I take a listen to what, how much they have applied what they know. So th this is both higher or lower order and higher order thinking skills put on one piece of paper or, or rather a cardboard or a poster, yeah? But when we do it via Webex, it's via that, yeah, yeah, infographic. And then I'm sure you're familiar with the three minute thesis, right? So this is also something which you can do, you know, when you make the students, okay, uh, in three minutes, why don't you, uh, we're about to finish our class, you know, before you sign off, you make the students uh, summarize the class or, or point out what they like about the class or point out what they want to know more in the next class you know that three taking the concept of three minute thesis what I'm trying to say is that we have it a two minute paper but when we do it via ODL it's a two minute of verbal interaction and of course the checklist which I've mentioned earlier and um, number four what I have is that provide tasks that encourage students to evaluate synthesize and create output within the modular format so if you follow my suggestion uh, I shared with you earlier about the scrapbook, about the poster presentation, the checklist, that is the output. Uh, remember the three Ps? The third P, the produce, uh, this is what they produce, the output, yeah? And uh, number five is providing platforms or channels for shared students' work. Now, we want to encourage interaction, remember? And there are students who are interactive. 
So what we need to do to cater to the students who are interactive, and after all, we don't want them to think that there's just you and them. There's just you and one student. It's actually you, him, and the rest of his classmates, and the classmates and him. What you need to do is to provide a platform where all the students' work are shared. Uh, I've seen many of my friends using Padlet. So when Padlet, you get to see, uh, you know, at the same time where they can put up things, but not fine. But what about if you don't have the internet? So you being the teacher there, you need to do the extra mile for you to you are the platform. You are the ones who will host all this variety of assignment submission and you need to come up with one form of summary and that summary you're going to share with everybody. So Padlet is easy, everybody puts up their work there and then everybody gets to see all. But what about those without that technology? What about those without the internet? Think of the unthinkable, think of the worst scenario. So you are the one, this is when the, your students need to depend on you because you receive all the submission from your students. You collected all the 25 or all the 40 uh, submissions of uh, student feedback. You need to do that, that you know, summar, summarizing and then you need to share. And that, to me, that is organic in nature where they also learn from each other. And to me, that is that is motivating to the students because when they receive that summary from you, they can see, hey, that's their point. Oh, that's their comment. Oh, that's their content, you know? So to me, that is how you spark their intrinsic motivation. You make the students realize that you care about what they did. You are interested with what they want to share and you, and you appreciate their effort that you put that in your summary. So if I were to be that student, I look forward to receiving the summary of the topic from you because the summary would entail all the feedback or all the input from the class, yeah, students. And that is why number six, I put that teacher becomes the heart of the learning flow. You, know, you're, you are the heart that receives and pump out the blood, the body. So learning is a journey, learning is a process. So you are the heart that pumps up, receives and pumping out. Okay, so here, what I have mentioned to you just now, I've already um, listed them down on this slide. The learning log, log is when you make the students uh, uh, pin down yeah, or, or uh, note down what the information they look for and what prior knowledge do they refer to. Maybe you make it simpler for them or you allow them to be creative yeah, in their learning log. Portfolio already mentioned, poster presentation also already mentioned, the scrapbook as well as the checklist and the students' targeted goals. Yeah. And um, next is remember, yeah, it is not the technology. Yeah? I repeat, yeah, it is not the technology. It is not the technology, but the pedagogy and engagement. We have Mr. Google. We've got all the search engines. Information is everywhere, but then what the students can do with the information matters. And we need to learn. We need to learn and relearn and unlearn. We are not the sole owner of knowledge. It is time to let it go, let it go, like frozen, yeah? It's time to let it go. It's time for the students to apply the lifelong learning strategies. Gradually, I'm not saying that you do it now, tomorrow they become lifelong learners. Gradually, slowly, bit by bit. It's a process, remember? It's a journey. It's an experience, an impactful, meaningful experience. So at the end, we also reflect uh, on our students' work, yeah? Look at the output, look at the poster, look at, read the learning log, look at the checklist, look at their self-assessment that they, they, they have uh, pro provided feedback. So look at this, look at the formative assessment, look at the tasks and activities, you know, how you have engaged and observed them. There's a reason why I said look. It's not just about looking, it's actually about analyzing how have they developed. Uh, are they okay? Remember, pedagogy is all about questions and more questions and probably more questions because you don't know whether things are working or things are not working. Or what else needs to be amended, yeah? So it's in a way providing improvement for the planning strategies. And I'm finishing, don't worry. I'm finishing. The power of teacher feedback. You know, when we make our students do things, yeah? they look forward to receive your feedback. It's your assignment now. It's not just the assignment. Your assignment is when they have submitted their assignments to you. Your assignment is to give them your feedback. 
So the thing about feedback, obviously, rule number one is always constructive comments. It could be either holistic or analytic. Or not alarm. Analytic, I could understand for some courses, which is very, uh, what do you call that, um, very specific in nature, then maybe you need to give analytic feedback. But for some courses, which are in a way uh, philosophical or abstract or to encourage gradual growth, because it's not just at one point, it's like ongoing. Yeah? So you can give an, a holistic uh, set of comments. And learning, I like to quote uh, my big brother, Professor Karim from USM. He says this, to him, learning is connecting the dots. I totally agree. Learning is connecting the dots, but it starts with us connecting with our students and the keyword, emotionally. We need to connect with our students emotionally. And here is all those 21st century uh, skills when we talk about CCS. To him, learning is connecting the dots. I totally agree. Learning is connecting the dots, but it's with us. Okay, and over here, since I'm from the Faculty of Education, allow me to finish, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, allow me to appreciate all those teachers out there. 16th of May is our teacher, uh, celebration of Teacher's Day. Yeah? I'm a teacher, you're a teacher, everybody here is a teacher, whether we are at school or whether we are at the university, we are all teachers. So, you know that the tema for this year is Beguru Demi Ilmu, Bina Generasi Baharu. It's so deep in meaning, yeah? Generasi Baharu, okay? Uh, coming from pandemic, uh, 20, uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19, we have a new uh, population of young ones, inshallah, those who are more independent, lifelong learners, inshallah. And allow me to share with you what the minister has in his speech. He said that eh, tema ini menyentuh peranan guru dalam memperkasa keilmuan dan profesionalisme bagi membina generasi baru negara yang dapat memenuhi matlamat falsafah pendidikan kemasaan. Now friends, do you know our philosophy of education, the national philosophy of education? Not too late to find out. Uh, it's all about have, coming up with a balanced and holistic student. Yeah? And guru merupakan insan yang sentiasa dahaga, dahagakan ilmu dan tidak jemu memperlengkap dirinya dengan pelbagai pengetahuan, kemahiran dan nilai sejajar dengan prinsip pembelajaran sepanjang hayat. So all along, I talk about student empowerment which has the attributes of lifelong learners. It's not just about the students, yeah? It's also about us. Panagogy is all about questions and more questions and more questions, meaning we are learning and learning and learning and more to learn. So if we embrace lifelong learning, who are we not to embrace our lifelong learning when we want our students to embrace lifelong learning? And again, this is from Dr. Muhammad Razi, the minister. We are going into a new normal because we are creating a brave new world and we have to start with the children to give them courage, to give them initiative, to help them look at problems realistically and to continually have hope and confidence that we will overcome. So on to the brave new world. That is what Dr. Muhammad Razi said. Yeah? And if I may, one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, all time ever, Martin Luther King was so famous with a lot of quotations. This is what he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm also, I need this dosage, you know. He said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And finally, the, the blessed month, and the holy month of Ramadan, allow me to recite one verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. It says here, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan ila wushraha. That interpreted as, Allah does not burden a soul beyond that it can bear. Inshallah. On that note, I thank this to my ex-student, Suhaili Abdullah. I hope you are here. I got this from your FB. A beautiful photo there. Teaching is a work of heart. This jive very well when I say teachers are the heart of the learning flow. Thank you very much and I welcome should there be any question. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Baiklah, demikianlah tadi perkongsian daripada Profesor Dr. Faiz Abdul Majid. Sekarang dipersilakan kepada para peserta untuk mengajukan sebarang pertanyaan. Dipersilakan.
kepada peserta yang nak tanyakan sebarang soalan boleh on mic dan uh, tanyakan terus kepada Prof insyaAllah For those who say, for those who say thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you to, from me actually for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give your best, yeah, people. Give your best. Uh, Prof, kita ada satu soalan daripada Dr. Adrian Hussein di ruangan komen. Okay. Uh, soalannya, Prof Aizah, do you agree that not all courses can be done online? Not all courses can be done online. Uh, do I agree? Um, I would say it's not about courses. It's actually content. Yeah. Um, content of the courses uh, or the learning outcomes of the courses. Uh, if I were to say uh, no, I would be very wrong because actually it can be done via online that is why we've got open university uh, open universities and that's why we've got uh, you know the idea of MOOCs uh, and, and, and all and whatnot but then again it also comes with the skill of the instructor what do you put in in that uh, in the online content um, it's not easy actually eh, to do online learning uh, or to, pro to provide uh, online content. It's not just a meal of you preparing your PowerPoint and putting that up and then give instruction for the students and the students to do it and submit via online and you consider that as online. No, it's, it, it, this is what I said that TPCK, eh, Technology Pedagogical Content Knowledge, you know, the technology of using online platform requires you to understand the philosophies behind the technology, why we use that technology and the, the motivation and the psychological aspect of that uh, of of the learning management system that you are using, you know, um, don't don't be too easily um, attracted to offer things online without you understanding the theories and the philosophies and and whatnot. So, if you were to say, uh, do I agree whether uh, all courses can be offered online? I said yes, all courses can be offered online, but the trick is you must know why you want to do it online. And you also must know the theories and the philosophies behind it, the tricks of that technology. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. I hope that I have answered. Prof. Soalan seterusnya daripada Dr. Farahidatul Akmal Awaludin. Yeah. So, soalannya, any tips on how to build short attention spans among students in ODL? Okay, short attention span uh, in ODLs. Okay, uh, se sebenarnya izinkan saya guna dua bahasa ya. Eh? Kejap bahasa Melayu, kejap bahasa Inggeris ya. Eh? I hope you don't mind. Um, short, when we do ODL, sebenarnya memang semua student memang short attention span. You cannot expect macam dia orang datang dalam kelas, kita mengajar dua jam tu, even dalam dalam kelas pun. <laughs> I, I would I would I would question the one attention is only the first 10 15 minutes the most because you do a lot of talking. Uh, kalau kita ingat ya ada satu piramid tu if you just google uh, 90 5% students will be uh, remembering and engaged in in your subject or in your lesson when you allow peer teaching. Only 5% they will remember when you lecture. So if you recall eh, I'm sure you will just google the pyramid is there. So kalau tip dia senang aja Let's talk. Don't talk. But by the first few instructions and then you design the learning journey, the learning experience with tasks. You give them the materials, you ask them to search for more materials and tasks. And those tasks could be individual, it could be, it could be uh, work, uh, what do you call that? Group work. Uh, so then, don't have to worry about short attention span. Yang kita worry short attention span is because kita nak student pay attention to us. Why must we make them pay attention to us? Because the attention should be on them, between them, amongst them, and they learn. Uh, so the idea is to empower the student. Yeah? 
I hope I have answered that, insyaAllah. Uh, Prof. Soalan seterusnya daripada Dr. Nur Halilah Buhari, Buhari. Yeah. Uh, So soalannya Prof, how about course that don't have lecture and we have to turn it into online How to tackle the attention of the student or to monitor the progress of the students? Okay, um, basically the, the, the question tu I have answered during my talk uh, di mana How do you monitor? Remember we've got, I, I proposed that strategies when you plan your class, you've got that checklist of the attainment of the learning outcomes and then you encourage the students to come up with their own, with their own uh, targeted goals. What do they want to, to be able to do at the end of this topic, at the end of this subject, at the end of this session with you, contohnya, yeah? Uh, so that is you monitoring them already. And then we also have the task that you prepared for them, we have provided for them and the materials that you provided and you also ask them to to come up with materials, to search for more materials. This is the time where the students will be given that responsibility to find more rather than just depending on your materials. So whatever that they bring in, those activities, remember I mentioned about formative assessment just now, all the tasks and activities that you do in the class, they are not for grading. Nama je assessment, formative assessment, but assessment to the assessment for learning, what, what the students can do so far that you can observe and what do you need to do more so that the students can can, can learn and, and develop to, to a level which you expect them to be at least, you know. Uh, so that is already monitoring. So if in, in an online, the teacher talks less, yeah, but the teacher does more observation. That observation is when you monitor the students uh, learning or not learning, yeah, inshallah. Okay, terima kasih Prof. Soalan seterusnya datang daripada Dr. Zuriani Yaakob. Mm -hmm. Prof, what what is your practice in ensuring uh, academic integrity in online learning and online assessment? Okay, okay. The the term academic integrity is actually very what we call that um, important. Yeah. Uh, before we ask, before we question our students' integrity, we must first question our integrity. Um, how do we ensure we we have integrity when we provided all those materials when we make them do the tasks? Um, no, that is the first one, integrity. And then you observe the student's integrity. It's not something which you build overnight. Yeah, Inte Integrity is actually, uh, oh, thank you for that. I, now I, I can, if, if you can spare me a few more minutes to answer this question. When we talk about learning, there are three domains, right? We've got the cognitive domain, we've got the psychomotor domain, and we've got the affective domain. And this question will require us to go and look at the affective domain. There's a pyramid, like cognitive domain and Bloom's taxonomy, you know, bottom near, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the pyramid is uh, remembering, uh, sorry, knowledge, yeah? uh, knowledge, understanding. At the top is actually uh, creation. The affective uh, domain pula, the top two actually characters. Di mana dia orang dah imitate, dia orang dah observe, dia orang dah receive, dia orang dah imitate, dia orang dah emulate, dia orang dah adapt to a point that at the peak of the effective domain is when they, it becomes a part of them, is their identity, where they have absorbed those, those values. So if you want to ensure integrity, it begins with you. And number two, it's a process because it's a nilai though. It's, it's a value that you don't, you don't just tell them the nilai and tomorrow they have that nilai, no. It's a nilai that you show, that you embrace, that you do throughout your lesson, throughout the semester, throughout the years that they are with you, throughout the university years. And they, and they, kalau cognitive domain, sorry, affective domain too, they will first observe and then they will respond. They value up to a point it becomes part of them. So that is uh, how we can train integrity to our students via online. Yeah? Not just via online tau, via apa-apa cara kita mengajar pun, we must always remember we are training the integrity. Uh, that is why uh, there was one, I had a webinar some one or two weeks ago and there was a question. On, on something similar, then I said, we are not teaching our subject. We are not just teaching our subject. Our subject is our platform to teach the values. Because at the end of the day, what are we producing? We are producing manusia. So we are producing manusia with these values and we are so lucky we do it through teaching math, through teaching English, through teaching music. Yeah. Inshallah. Uh, okay, baik Prof. Saya bacakan soalan terakhir daripada uh, Dr. Muhammad Razi Manap dan juga Dr. Tengku Intan Bazura. Okay. Soalan would be the most significant difference 
between ODL in normal time and during pandemic like now dan soalan yang kedua um, Prof Aizah, dental and medicals uh, hands-on andragogy it is still a face-to-face -face learning environment any views from you? Okay, uh, I'll try to answer the first question. Yeah? What's the difference between ODL in normal time and ODL during pandemic time? The difference is that it's pandemic. <laughs> the difference is pandemic in the sense that there are many constraints. Uh, people are worried about safe, safety. Safety is always first. So, kalau ODL normal time, life is normal. They can go out, they can go to the malls, they can go to the library, they can go and observe things and do your assignment when they... Because you can ask them to interview, they can go out and interview. That is, that is ODL via normal times. But now it's pandemic time, it's COVID-19 time, lockdown time, restricted movement time. So whatever you want you want them to do is actually via platforms that are available in their hand. To yang tadi panic go to, we ask them what resources do you have? So whatever resources they have, itulah dia yang terbaiknya. If they don't have the internet, forget about googling, forget about uh, using search engine. But what do you do? Then you become, you know, You need to supply them with materials. You need to supply them with materials. And ODL during pandemic allow me to, to share with you a story, real story happening in Sabah. The, uh, also the story I got from my friend who is with the Ministry of Education. Um, last year, there was a winner for Adiwira, eh? Pembelajaran Abad ke-21. Uh, there was an Adiwira and this guy is in Sabah. I forgot his name, minta maaf. But the good thing about him, walaupun dia adiwira abad ke-21, he, when he teaches, he didn't actually use the internet because over at his school, he is in a remote area, there is no internet. So forget about do, using kahoot ke, using padlet ke, no. But still, he was the winner. You know what? Abad ke-21 is not about using technology. Abad, uh, pengajaran abad ke-21 is actually about teaching the skills, the, the creativity, thinking skills, the crit uh, critical thinking skills. The communication, the collaboration, and the team, the team building, uh, team, uh, team player, leadership, you know, and he did that very creatively via him becoming the library for the students. He would dress, he would come to class dressed up as a robot. He would come to class dressed up as one of the superhero. He went extra mile to do that. And and now, cerita terbaru mengenai dia adalah, this one was just told to me uh, some three weeks ago, my friend, we were on, on our usual uh, chat room and she shared uh, this story. You know what that guy is doing in Sabah now? Because sana tak ada internet and everybody is uh, locked down. Dia collaborated dengan jawatan kuasa kecil kampung. He was on a, she will, he will be on, on uh, in a car. The JKK will drive because having the JKK, he get to go around and being a teacher, he has envelopes. They are the easily 40 students. So he went around the village to all the 40 houses Hantar envelope and drop one envelope and took the envelope that he dropped yesterday. What's in that envelope? Are uh, the read, uh, the reading materials, are uh, the handouts, the worksheets, and the punya instruction. So that is ODL in pandemic. Uh, ODL normal, post laju ada, you know delivery ada, but ODL pandemic, you look at the context as worst a scenario that we can think about the one that I just shared with you in Sabah. But even now, lucky for us. And that we can do with the classroom. But the student cannot go out there and interview people face to face. If there is an assignment that you make them interview or observe, you know, pergi dekat Aeon Mall ke contohnya and observe the consumer behavior, they can't do that. That is ODL in pandemic. ODL normal time, walaupun you all, dia dekat Sabah, you dekat, you dekat Shah Alam, dia boleh pergi mall, uh, Borneo Mall. Is it one Borneo Mall? Uh, dekat dengan UMS tu? Dekat dengan UITM. <laughs> Medik dengan dentistry itu face to face, macam mana tadi soalannya? Soalan yang kedua dari Encik Mizi. Uh, dental and medicals are hands-on and Andragogy. It is still a face-to-face -face learning environment. Any views from you? I totally agree because I wouldn't want to have uh, a doctor who graduated from YouTube. Uh, <laughs> there, there was a, a comic strip again when there's this man is on, on, the, on the operation theater and the doctor was about to cut him open and he asked the doctor, where did you graduate from? Oh, I graduated from YouTube. Ah, terus menggigil. 
So I I totally agree uh, for critical um, discipline yeah, like where there is a hands on, especially bertarung dengan nyawa, eh, talking about nyawa. Yes, um, memang kena face to face. But then again, kita dalam pandemic COVID-19. Remember, I talk about uh, chunking and sequencing. When I talked about it, I talked about specific topic. But here, I that question allow me to talk about a curriculum. Bila kita nak melahirkan satu gra, uh, kumpulan graduan yang doktor, graduan yang dentist, you know, kita melihat pada kurikulumnya. So tentu sekali kurikulum tu ada 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 khusus-khusus yang boleh dijalankan secara ODL dahulu. So mungkin khusus-khusus yang memerlukan where the students need to to be in a lab, need to be in a simulation room, you know, need to actually work on a patient or, or on, a, on a dummy patient, wallah alam, where they can about the project based or problem based learning where the supervisor will observe macam mana dia check on the patient and whatnot, yeah, wallah alam, you know your, you know your content better. I agree, yeah. Uh, yang itu memang kena face to face, tidak boleh tidak because we're talking about nyawa here, it's critical profession. That is why uh, the beauty of curriculum, uh, kalau kita go back eh, to, to the to the document, to the blueprint of any educational program is the curriculum. We look at the curriculum, it's a four-year or it's a six-year program, we look at the khusus-khusus-khusus, khusus mana yang kita ni, COVID-19 ni yang kita boleh uh, jalankan dahulu. Kalau khusus tu heavy on a face-to-face, on a, on a, on a, uh, on a hands-on, yeah, then that one will have to wait uh, sehingga we are able to come back. And the good thing, uh, slowly but surely, uh, things are getting better. I'm not saying that we are going to be locked down forever. Even now pun, there are suggestions di mana uh, untuk budak-budak medik, or budak dentist, atau dentistry, ataupun budak-budak mana, uh, even uh, hotel and tourism yeah, yang kena pergi ke kitchen, or even uh, from FSSR yang kena ke studio. Uh, there are suggestions, kita kena be creative. Remember, we have to have gener- generative solution, we have to be compassionate, we have to find creative solution. We, we could think about having students coming in smaller groups, you know, jadi dalam 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 lab tu ada lima orang atau ada enam orang tapi social distance and they are, they are working on something. So be creative. Jangan kata tak boleh buat kelas tu because it's OD, uh, ODL saja. But when it comes to perlu guna lab, perlu datang ke kitchen, perlu datang ke uh, simulation room, datanglah but observe the uh, SOP, the social distancing, you know, uh, smaller group, maybe lima orang, less than, less than, less than six. Less than, less than eight, I assume, depends on how big the, the ruang is. All right, again, eh? Back to life pedagogy. Cik Mizi, back to you. Baiklah, demikianlah tadi uh, sesi soal jawab bagi uh, webinar kita pada pagi ini. Uh, diingatkan kepada semua peserta untuk mengisi e-kehadiran di pautan Google Form yang telah diletakkan di ruangan komen. Seterusnya bagi peserta yang mengikuti sesi webinar ini melalui live streaming, kehadiran boleh diisi dengan mengimbas QR code yang dipancarkan di skrin oleh pihak Urusiti sekarang. Baiklah sekali lagi mewakili pihak Barisan Penganjur, Fakulti Pendidikan UITM dan Bahagian Penyelidikan dan Inovasi UITM Cangang Selangor Kami ingin merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada Prof. Dr. Faiz Abdul Majid di atas sesi perkongsian pada hari ini Dan juga diucapkan terima kasih kepada semua peserta yang menyertai sesi webinar kita pada pagi ini InsyaAllah semoga berjumpa lagi di masa yang akan datang Baiklah Prof. Sekian wabila topik wali daya Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Terima kasih Thank you. Semoga bermanfaat ya And give your best Assalamualaikum